Hello everyone, this is a Historothon 2024 Q3 review of The Other Renaissance by Paul Strathern. It was published in uh, 2023 and it is also for my series called Slow History. One of the first things that we encounter in The Other Renaissance is a, a, a name or two that crop up in each chapter that are um, otherwise and perhaps more ordinarily in apposite both the common knowledge and the broader ideas of the Renaissance. Vietti, Mercator, Montaigne, Bruegel. How about it? It uh, would seem like um, the other Renaissance or another Renaissance to me. But um, the, uh, nonetheless, the apparent mystery is soon neatly unpacked, as they say. Uh, what emerges is what is described as a northern Renaissance. North of the Alps lies modern-day Belgium, England and France and the German states of the Holy Roman Empire. We have perhaps all heard of Petrarch, but what about Nicholas of Cusa? Surely uh, numbers are the clue to wisdom and what man does not desire and that man does not desire another nature, only the perfection of his own. And by nature man is free. We haven't missed all this, surely. And thereafter, an interesting issue is how history again seemingly appears straightforward, perhaps almost child's play for some. Literally, how many students of literature take history for granted? or students of politics and governance. The encounter with the work of Copernicus, for example, in the other Renaissance, and which has, includes particular lines, such as how Copernicus, quote, dislodged humanity from its central place in the universe, an event which would provoke a subtle but profound psychological effect on the human psyche. That is some statement, isn't it? We know of the details, and it does seem well, straightforward. I mean, the Earth does in fact go round the Sun, not the other way around, and the stars above do not revolve around the Earth either. It is the Earth's revolutions that turn within a vast cosmos that moves on its own unerring course. But how does that play out, that subtle but profound psychological effect on the human psyche? What kinds of expression of this state of mind were discernible? over the course of the first generations. And more to the point, how do we know what how do we know that? I mean what evidence has been left to us in order to appreciate as much? And is this a question that takes the next three hundred and sixteen pages of the other Renaissance to appreciate and gradually realise? Perhaps this is uh, this question is lost in fact in a wall of details. When the world turns, it is really all just timing. Good or bad, I mean the church was fairly well known and thought of as somewhat self-aggrandizing, and at the same time innovative men of some uh, genius were beginning to challenge some of the fundamentals of Western society. And what are the consequences, as must be? Did mankind learn about a lower sense of self-importance? Has life itself become less meaningful? Or did we make sense of things anew that brought us towards a realisation of life that includes both science and the religious turn? To thinking people, a realisation sensibly undeniable. And moreover, when everyone has the liberty to form and hold their own opinions, what then? What then? A malaise? Or a grand bolognese? You say tomato, I say tomato. And so on. Down the steps and across town, and out into the world. Governance, control, coercion, and madness, power, and domination. These are some of the major problems and tendencies of human nature. So how do you teach freedom? How do you teach an appreciation for liberty? To respect people's right to an opinion, and the value of values. Perhaps the pick of the bunch in um, uh, Strathern's book is the chapter that includes Montaigne. Um, he wrote essays on idleness, educating children, solitude, friendship, the lame, fear, cruelty and drunkenness. He also had a love of animals. Apparently, whenever his dog enticed him, he could never refuse to play games with it. And similarly, he said, when I play with my cat... Who knows if I am not a pastime to her 
more than she is to me. Well, um, overall, I think it is a four-star read out of five. Um, I shouldn't pay any attention to what the Financial Times says, and probably not the Times either. Maybe the Literary Review. There it is. Uh, nice book. Um, four out of five. Uh, from me, anyway. For what it's worth. And, uh, well, bye for now.